Chapter 19 of Workers Together. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Workers Together or an Endless Chain by Pansy. Chapter 19 Problems. The human heart is a very curious instrument. Over this thought, Dr. Everett lingered much in the days which immediately followed the episode at the store. He exulted in the outcome of it all. Mr. Cady had exceeded his hopes. He knew the whole story, having received it from voluble and excited Thomas Riley, helped frequently by his no less excited father, and he heard it again in detail from Robert Parks. That young man had been more deeply and tenderly moved than, perhaps, ever in his life before. He had come home with eyes that bore traces of tears, had sought for Dr. Everett, and frankly assured him that he believed himself to be a fool and a villain. He had taken back with lavish tongue all the severe words spoken but the night before. He had declared that Mr. Cady was a Christian, if there was one on earth. He told how Mr. Cady, when he sought him in the inner office as soon as he could, to express his gratitude, had grasped his hand and said, Young man, I don't want you to judge of religion by my life. I am very far from being Christ-like. Look to him. And when he repeated the words in his wonderfully subdued voice, Dr. Everett could not help thinking concerning him, This young man is not far from the kingdom. Yet, strange to say, as the days passed, the entire incident seemed to be having a hardening influence. True, Robert Parks did not grow sullen again. On the contrary, as his strength increased and his health became firm, he grew gay and flippant, to a degree that often sorely tried Mrs. Saunders's patience. "'I don't know what you two see in that fellow to give you any patience with him,' she would occasionally remark in a half-vexed tone. "'It seems to me that he grows worthless every hour.' "'You two always meant, to Mrs. Saunders, Joy and Dr. Everett. Not that she intended to couple their names, but that it seemed so natural to speak of their work in this way.' for it was very evident that these two were interested in the same people, and were earnestly trying to do the same things. Neither was Mrs. Saunders by any means ready to desert the young man, Robert, and leave a fair field to the enemy. She faithfully did her share, and seconded every effort that was made to win him. At the same time, it was a relief to speak her mind occasionally, when he was especially exasperating and even the doctor was obliged to own, as the days went by, that provocation in this direction was increasing. One thing concerning him added greatly to the doctor's sorrow and joy's distress. It was the undeniable influence which the girl Hester Mason had over him. He had never dropped the acquaintance commenced in the sunset room on that unfortunate afternoon. Neither had Joy apparently accomplished anything with the girl, beyond the fact that Hester Mason was proud of being recognized on the street by Joy, and showed her gratitude by favoring Joy's purchases in the store to such a degree that she grew alarmed, lest she was simply a temptation to the girl, and did her shopping elsewhere. Hester came no more to the sunset room. General invitations to call on her Joy freely gave, but after the disastrous result of her first attempt, she seemed not to have courage for a second special effort, and the doctor was silent on the subject. So it really seemed that the only outcome of that day had been a new worsted sea-foam which Hester Mason wore and looked pretty in, and a friendship formed which was unfortunate for both parties. Over this one result the doctor mused a good deal. Why had the effort been allowed to produce positive harm? Had he not been single-hearted in his desire to help a soul? He was studying over these and kindred trying problems when he rang Miss Mason's doorbell one evening. The evening, by the way, was a summer one, several months having elapsed since the episode at the store. It was not Miss Hester Mason, you understand, but the Sabbath school teacher, whom he had earnestly tried to rouse to a sense of her duties and responsibilities. His failure in that direction had, he believed, been almost as marked as in the other. At least Miss Mason's interest in her work, if real, was fitful to a degree that an earnest worker could not understand. She made many visits which kept her away from home over the Sabbath, 
and the idea that she should inform her superintendent of intended absence, or secure a suitable substitute for her class, seemed never to have dawned upon her. Then there were Sabbaths when her bodily presence was all that she seemed able to give her class. The eyes and attention of the very gayest of her number were not more easily diverted than were hers. And Dr. Everett would observe her yawning wearily behind her fan during the closing exercises. These disappointing Sabbaths were occasionally relieved by an oasis, when Miss Mason seemed roused and eager, earnest in her class, anxious for results. The superintendent studied her, trying to account for these changing moods, and having little difficulty in doing so, as he came to know her better. She was preeminently a woman who was moved by impulse. The last person who had speech with her, given the fact that he was a person of any strength of mind, held her to his views, until the next comer jostled against them. The fact was, she was struggling with that old problem which continually occupies so many minds, namely how to serve two masters. The gay world had her in possession more than half her time, during which she dressed and danced, and frequented the theatre, and played her social game of cards, and was altogether of the earth, earthy. Into the midst of this sort of life would come a jostle in the shape of a few minutes' talk with Dr. Everett, during which he would contrive to ask her many questions, of such a character that her conscience would awaken to the difference between his Christian life and hers. Then would occur that oasis, or she would meet Joy Saunders, and, not by question so much as by the very atmosphere which at all times seemed to surround Joy, be impressed in a similar manner. If only some vigorous mind could have held steady control over Miss Mason, and swayed her to his wishes, what a worker she might have made. Something of this also Dr. Everett was thinking, while he waited in the parlor for her coming. It colored the very first words he uttered after greeting her. How much do you believe in personal magnetism, Miss Mason? Not much, I think. Or, yes, I do. Well, I don't know that I understand you. Why? This answer was eminently characteristic of Miss Mason, at least when she tried to talk with Dr. Everett. She seemed never sure of her ground, always a trifle fearful, lest he should mean something which her mind did not reach. "'I wish you could magnetize your namesake,' he said, coming abruptly to the subject of his thoughts. "'I met her just now in bad company for her and for him. Can't we do something towards saving that girl?' Do you mean Hester Mason? I'm sure I don't know what to do. She isn't interested in anything but fun. I can't get hold of her, doctor. I don't know how to do things of that sort. I don't believe I ought to be a Sabbath school teacher anyhow. I tried to help Hester Mason. That time in the winter when you were so much interested in her, I went to her house to call. She lives in a very disagreeable neighborhood, but I braved it. I didn't do any good. She was at home, which her aunt said was a wonder, for she was generally out. I tried to talk with her about being careful of her voice and manner on the street, and to give her a hint or two about dress, and she didn't take it kindly at all. She very nearly told me it was none of my business. And she did not come to Sunday school again for four weeks. I don't believe she would have come again at all if Joy Saunders had not coaxed her back. I'm sure I almost hoped she wouldn't come back. I don't know what to do with her. What are you going to do with her tomorrow? This was one of Dr. Everett's peculiar questions, which greatly tried Miss Mason. He would not generalize. He would not talk about past failures. He took swift strides ahead, aiming at definite points, aiming at something which she had not thought of before. This is why she repeated, Tomorrow? Yes, in your class. What is there in the lesson for Hester Mason, for instance, provided she is present? I haven't the least idea. I am always hoping that she will not come, because I don't know what to do with her, nor with any of the rest of them, for that matter. But she is the worst. The poor superintendent could not restrain a sigh. How was he to do the master's work with such helpers as this? However, he struggled with the problem, going over the lesson story, calling Miss Mason's attention to points, 
which he deemed of the most importance or best suited to her class she interrupted him once to say if she knew how to manage the bible as he did she was sure she could get something out of it to help even those girls but as it was she believed he simply discouraged her if you would but form the habit of attending the teachers meeting he told her you would find regular help and stimulus this was an old topic often discussed between them miss mason felt her face flushing admitted she always meant to attend but the week was so full of engagements she never seemed to get time on the whole the doctor went away feeling that his call had done no good and that something ought to be done about that class since she could not teach it why did she not resign and give him a chance to supply her place end of chapter 19 recording by tricia g